TBJ TV News. 11 o'clock report. Good evening. The state's fact-finding report on Virginia Western Community College is out, but some of the most important sections have been censored. It does include new revelations of questionable purchases at the school. The State Community College Board's Executive Committee released the document in Richmond tonight, and Mark Freiberg reports. Nine of the report's 52 pages were blacked out, along with sections of several others. The legible portion listed six uses of the college's funds which the committee suggested to be improper or questionable. Faculty staff retreats to resort locations which were primarily social in nature, numerous working lunches, Christmas gifts for employees, photo enlargements of Queen Elizabeth's visit to the United States, a wedding gift for a faculty member's daughter, and faculty staff picnics. The document also confirms news media reports that President Harold Hopper's home was remodeled in part by college workers on the state payroll, though Hopper indicated to the investigators that the late head of maintenance at the college, John Young, was asked to oversee the project. The report reads, we did not find any evidence that the president paid Young for the extensive amount of work, 11 to 13 days, Young was responsible for. In Hopper's reply attached to the report, he suggests he was not aware that Young wasn't reimbursed, that Hopper had asked his wife to pay the bills. The report also confirms that the college bought a tow bar to pull in one of Hopper's cars. State Board Chairman Bernard Haggerty says Hopper will be asked to reimburse the state for those personal items Hopper has already agreed to. But the part of the fact-finding committee report that appeared to have the greatest impact on the state board is totally blacked out in the released version. It deals largely with Hopper's treatment of employees. The state staff says the deletions include pending personnel matters, which could lead to litigation, and the observations and conclusions of the fact-finding committee. It's a portion which some board members have described as highly critical of Hopper. Mark Freiberg, Channel 7 News. The gas tax has been defeated again. By a 49 to 44 vote, the House of Delegates tonight voted down a two cents a gallon tax increase on gasoline. But the tax's sponsor says he'll try to revive the tax again, probably tomorrow. Paul Lancaster reports. For dying once, being born again, and being delayed three times, the gas tax was finally debated on the floor of the House this evening. The arguments were familiar to those who followed the tax's progress through committee, but both sides took time to make their points one more time for and against. Most of us in the House have had our problems with the Department of Highway in the past, and there is little question that that department has built for itself a solid base of animosity in parts of this chamber with its arrogance of past years. However, we cannot cut our noses off to spite our faces. One of the finest highway systems in the land belongs to the people of this commonwealth. It should remain just that way. They need the money for the 244 employees that they budgeted for and for the $38 million for new equipment that they're going to get. Is that what that money's going to come in for? I don't know. But let's think about it. These are some of the figures that came up before us, and this is the reason why originally the Finance Committee voted to keep this thing in committee and look at it for a year. After close to an hour's debate, the bill was voted by a show of hands. The results announced by House Speaker A.L. Philpott. Eyes 44, nose 49, House Group to gross and pass the bill to its third reading. The bill was defeated, but not necessarily killed. That is, sponsor Martin Perper says he'll try to revive the bill through some parliamentary maneuvering. Paul Lancaster, Channel 7 News, the state capitol. The state senate today killed a bill to revise Virginia's sterilization law. The law allowed the sterilization of thousands at state mental hospitals during a 50-year period prior to 1972. After word of the program recently became public, there was strong sentiment to change the law. But senators today said there were too many questions about the law, and they voted to kill the proposed changes until next year. Every Primary elections were held in both Massachusetts and Vermont today. On the Democratic side, President Carter won in Vermont, while Senator Edward Kennedy took Massachusetts. And the big surprise in the GOP race is Congressman John Anderson, who is leading in both state primaries. Walter Cronkite has more. This will be remembered as the day John Anderson, a veteran of Congress but a newcomer to presidential politics, forced his way into the race for the Republican nomination. 
Anderson did it with very strong showings in the Massachusetts and Vermont primaries, making both a lot closer than anyone had dreamt they'd be. Here's how the Republican contest looks in Massachusetts. With 49% of the vote counted, Anderson 31% being pressed by George Bush and Ronald Reagan with 30% each. And here's how Vermont looks in the Republican race. 86% of the vote counted there, Anderson 32%, Reagan 30%, and Bush trailing with 22%. The Democratic primaries in both states have the winner way out in front of the loser. Senator Edward Kennedy is the winner in Massachusetts, a home state victory over President Carter he had to have. And here's how that vote looks in Massachusetts' Democratic run. 49% of the vote in, Kennedy 65%, Carter 29%. In Vermont, Mr. Carter's an even bigger winner. And here's a check on that contest. 86% of the vote in, Carter 75%, Kennedy 25%. Again, for the Democrats, Kennedy is the winner in Massachusetts, President Carter in Vermont. But John Anderson, by doing so well in both GOP primaries, may be tonight's biggest winner of them all. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News Election Center in New York. The Ayatollah Khomeini has given his permission for the five-member UN Special Commission to visit the 50 American hostages. The militants who occupy the U.S. Embassy in Tehran have said in the past they would obey any order from Khomeini. Iran's foreign minister said tonight Ayatollah Khomeini has given his approval for the United Nations Commission to visit the hostages. The militants holding the embassy have been defying the Iranian government, insisting that the commission could see only a few of the hostages, and then only to hear testimony about their alleged role as spies. President Bani Sadr and Foreign Minister Gapzadeh have rejected the militants' terms. According to the militants' own account, the president warned them they were undermining the Iranian government. The dispute with the militants has turned into a test of strength for Bani Sadr, who is still trying to consolidate his power and is seeking broad support for his policies in the campaign for a new Iranian parliament. Bani Sadr, with the unanimous backing of the Revolutionary Council, has promised the UN Commission it will see all of the hostages during its visit to Tehran. Commission members, who earlier today held their seventh futile meeting with Gup Zadeh, learned that the militants had refused to show them all of the hostages until after they returned to New York to make their report on Iran's grievances against the Shah and the United States, and only on the condition that their report satisfied Iran. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. The U.S. is backing off from its vote over the weekend on the United Nations resolution against Israeli settlements on occupied Arab lands. Secretary of State Vance says he takes the blame for a lack of communications, which resulted in a yes vote instead of an abstention. The staff who began here at the U.N. Security Council on Saturday, when the U.S., in a hardening of American policy, called for the dismantling of Israeli settlements in occupied Arab territory. There were also various references to Jerusalem. Then, in an unusual statement issued by the White House last night, President Carter made it clear there had been a major error, saying that the failure to communicate clearly the U.S. position on Jerusalem to the U.S. ambassador at the U.N. resulted in a vote in favor of the resolution rather than abstention. Whose failure? As I said this morning, I accept responsibility. Yes, sir. Yep. The administration seemed to launch a damage control operation trying to put the best possible face on the embarrassing situation. What has been done here has been a remarkable uh, uh, exercise in candor. And if there's something wrong with candor, uh, then uh, there's something wrong with all of our values. The State Department made no effort to conceal that the administration's actions had boxed it into a no-win fix. There's nobody in this government who thinks that the net effect of this general exercise is positive. That view was shared outside the government. To what extent can we have confidence or the credibility of the American administration now is in doubt. If they vote in favor and a few hours later they disavow what they have voted in favor of, who would trust the United States uh, anymore? Bernard Kalb, CBS News, the State Department. The Israeli government today rejected the UN resolution, and Tom Fenton reports that despite the U.S. explanation the vote was an error, the Israelis are not satisfied. The severity of the cabinet's reaction matched what Israelis perceived as the severity of the Security Council resolution. Cabinet members didn't expect more from the United Nations, they had hoped for more from the United States. And they did not find President Carter's disavowal of the UN resolution particularly convincing. 
Justice Minister Shmuel Amir. We didn't feel that it answered all of the questions, or most of the questions, and there is still a deep feeling of anxiety and disappointment and dissatisfaction from a very strange, far-reaching uh, attitude by the United States. It doesn't help the peace process on the continent. One cabinet member called the Carter explanation cheap. Several officials said they felt humiliated that, on a matter of such importance as the status of Jerusalem, the President of the United States would claim a communications failure. Asked if he believed the President, one Israeli, who generally reflects Prime Minister Begin's thinking, replied, I believe in God. Everybody else pays cash, indicating, presumably, a certain degree of skepticism. But the bottom line for Israelis is that in 5, 10, or 20 years from now, the Security Council resolution will still be on the books. President Carter's explanation will have faded from memory. Bob Simon, CBS News, Jerusalem. All of Virginia's urban areas showed increased unemployment rates for January, and Lynchburg led the way. Layoffs at the Lynchburg Foundry pushed the Hill City's unemployment rate to 8.7 percent. That's a nearly 3.5 percent increase from December. Employment officials say the rise statewide was seasonal and not an indicator of a recession. Whether the motives are sincere or sinister, some Roanoke County residents say they don't like a proposal that they say could deny them a vote on how the county school board is picked. Paul Lancaster reports. The proposed vote is a follow-up to the county's decision a couple of years ago to go back to the traditional form of government. The transition was not complete. The county supervisors kept the power to pick school board members instead of giving that authority back to a court-appointed trustee electoral board. The premise was that a vote on the issue would take place later. But Senator Buzz Emick's bill would in essence cancel that vote, the argument being that most county residents want the supervisors to pick the school board anyway. However, a House subcommittee was told that's not the issue. If this bill passes and the Board of Supervisors does have a referendum, the referendum is defeated, this still gives the Board of Supervisors the authority and the right to return this power to themselves even though the people do not desire it. And this is negative government. The consensus of the subcommittee is to let the referendum take place, the argument that it wouldn't cost that much. And an issue as important to Roanoke County as its schools, Chairman Dick Cranwell says it's important that everything be done to find out what the people want. Paul Lancaster, Channel 7 News, Richmond. Only three school announcements for tomorrow. The public schools in the counties of Bedford, Charlotte, and Pennsylvania County will be opening one hour late. Dudley? A uh, chance of rain sometimes? Too? Yeah, there's a chance of rain, but, uh, you know, that sounds pretty good because we've been getting this little warming trend since I've been sitting in here for Hal. And, uh